China, where the Gobi Desert grows by about 3,000 kilometers each year. Ten years ago, China did something so bizarre that the whole world laughed. They dragged millions of tons of dead plant stalks into some of the most lifeless deserts on Earth and buried them in the sand. Experts scoffed. Foreign media mocked them. People called it a dumb publicity stunt. Planting in sand? That's not science, that's comedy. But the laughter didn't last. Back then, China was facing a nightmare. Deserts were eating its land alive. Fertile farmland was turning into nothing but dust and dunes. Towns were swallowed. Crops failed. Sandstorms hit so hard they blackened skies over Beijing, choked cities in South Korea and Japan, and even reached the United States. By the early 2000s, more than a quarter of China's land was already desert. Over 400 million people were living on the edge of these wastelands. In the north and northwest, deserts like the Taklamakan were advancing so fast that they were threatening to cut off highways, railways, and entire cities. China had tried planting trees before, billions of them. But in places like the Taklamakan, most simply died within a year. The soil had no nutrients, the wind ripped saplings out of the ground, and the dunes, constantly moving, either exposed roots until they dried out, or buried plants alive. The survival rate in some areas? Barely 15%. That's when they turned to something so simple, it almost looked stupid. Rice straw. China produces an unbelievable amount of rice every year, and with it comes mountains of leftover stalks. Normally it's burned or left to rot. But scientists had an idea. What if they took this trash and used it to fight the desert? So they did exactly that. They bundled the straw into grids, like a giant checkerboard, and laid it across the sand. Each square slowed the wind, trapped moisture, and stopped the dunes from moving. The straw slowly broke down into natural fertilizer, giving plants just enough nutrition to get started. At first, workers did this by hand, in searing heat, in sand so soft they could barely walk. For every square they dug trenches, placed the straw, and covered it back up. The work was brutal, the cost was high, and the results? Not instant. That's why critics kept laughing. They called it burying money in the sand. They said it would never survive the desert's fury. But year after year, China didn't quit. They adapted. They brought in machines that could lay straw lines four to six times faster than humans. They stopped planting weak, water-hungry trees like poplar and switched to native desert survivors. Tamarisk, saxol, goji berry, sea buckthorn. Plants that could take the heat, the wind, and the drought. The early straw grids began holding dunes in place. Sand movement dropped by over 99%. In those still patches, tiny shoots started appearing. Grasses, shrubs, even young trees. And slowly, the barren yellow turned green. And that's when something shocking began to happen. The desert started to fight back. But this time, China was ready. Every year the grid spread further. The goal wasn't just to plant more. It was to make each patch strong enough to survive on its own. Instead of forcing trees into the sand, they built whole ecosystems. First came the straw grids, then hardy shrubs and grasses. Later, stronger plants that could grow in the shelter of the first wave. But the real test wasn't in the planting. It was in surviving the brutal conditions. In places like the Taklamakan and Gobi, rain is almost non-existent. Summer can scorch at 45 degrees Celsius, and winters freeze at minus 20 degrees Celsius. In storms, walls of sand can roll for miles, burying anything in their path. For decades, these deserts had crushed every attempt to control them. Yet the new approach was different. The straw grids acted like shields. The first plants rooted deeper before the sand could shift. Once the roots took hold, they trapped more sand, creating microclimates, small protected zones where life could slowly expand. China's engineers didn't stop with the land. They used these green barriers to protect vital infrastructure. Railways that once faced constant shutdowns from drifting dunes stayed open. Highways through the desert, once considered impossible, now ran without being buried. Gravel belts, windbreak trees, and straw grids worked together to keep the sand in place. One of the boldest examples was the green belt around the Taklamakan Desert, 
Stretching over 3,000 kilometers, it wrapped the Sea of Death with a living wall. It didn't just hold the sand back. It stopped storms before they could reach cities hundreds of kilometers away. And the results weren't just visible on the ground. Satellites that once showed endless gray wasteland started picking up ribbons of green cutting across the desert. From space, you could see where the dunes had been stopped, where vegetation was taking over. With the land stabilized, something unexpected followed. Economic life. Locals began farming in areas once written off as useless. Hardy crops like goji berries, grapes, and desert herbs started growing in the shelter of the green belts. Farmers who had left during the worst desert years came back. Tourism emerged. People wanted to see with their own eyes how a dead desert had turned into living land. Internationally, the tone shifted. The same voices that had once mocked the project were now calling it a model. Other desert nations, from Africa's Sahel to the Middle East, started studying China's methods. The straw grids, the phased planting, the machine-assisted work. It was simple enough to copy, but effective enough to change landscapes. And while praise grew abroad, inside China, pride exploded. The desert was no longer something that only swallowed land. Now, it was something that could be pushed back. But the biggest shock came when scientists measured what had changed in just a decade. The numbers told a story no one could ignore. In just 10 years, the survival rate of new plantings had jumped dramatically. Areas that were once wastelands now had stable soil, richer nutrients, and enough cover to block deadly sandstorms. Entire stretches of land that used to be shifting dunes had transformed into permanent green zones. The impact on the air was huge. Cities that used to choke on dust every spring reported clearer skies. Hospital visits for respiratory problems dropped. Farmers could plant without fearing their crops would be buried or blown away. Even wildlife started to come back. Birds nesting in shrubs, insects pollinating plants, and small mammals returning to areas they had abandoned decades ago. The Green Wall wasn't just stopping the desert, it was changing the climate around it. By trapping dust and locking moisture in the soil, these zones stayed cooler and more humid than the open desert. The land was beginning to regulate itself without constant human intervention. Globally, scientists were stunned. NASA data showed that China's efforts were responsible for over a quarter of the world's net increase in green cover during the early 21st century. And much of that growth came directly from these desert reclamation projects. What had once been called a waste of money was now being hailed as one of the largest environmental comebacks in history. China didn't keep this knowledge to itself. Experts traveled abroad to help other nations build their own green barriers. In Africa's Great Green Wall project, straw grids and drought-resistant planting techniques were being tested on the edge of the Sahara. Central Asian countries battling expanding deserts began importing China's specialized machinery. What started as a desperate national experiment was now shaping global policy on how to fight desertification. Back home, the transformation also carried deep cultural weight. For decades, the desert was seen as unstoppable, a force that people could only run from. Now, it was proof that with enough planning, patience, and adaptation, even the harshest environments could be reshaped. Villages that had once been abandoned were seeing families return. Schools and clinics opened in areas that just years earlier were nothing but sand. And perhaps the most striking part? The deserts themselves seemed to be surrendering. Where once the dunes crept forward each year, satellite images showed the line holding, or even retreating. Green strips were no longer isolated. They were connecting, forming networks of vegetation that the wind couldn't break apart. The world had laughed at China for burying straw in the sand. They had called it naive, a fantasy, a waste. But a decade later, the evidence was undeniable. Against the odds, against the mockery, against the desert's own violence, China had turned an idea everyone dismissed into a weapon that could reclaim entire landscapes. And this was only the beginning because now the question wasn't whether deserts could be stopped. It was how far this method could push them back.